Hello everyone. Nice to see so many of you here joining my talk today. My name is Matthias. I work for a company that is named Ike Sponsor. We are a Munich-based 3D studio. We are working for television commercials. We are doing trade show backgrounds for the big car companies, Audi, BMW. And recently we also worked for a feature film and that is going to be my topic today, one of the two topics, one of the two projects I brought today is that feature film we worked on. The typical start of every presentation is just showing the showreel. Here's work that we did during the past two or three years or so. Enjoy. Your hands, my hands, your mouth. Thank you. That's how I spend my day. It's a quite diverse portfolio, I would say. We do on-air design all the way to industry visualization, and that's quite a lot of fun that we are so open to all kinds of projects. One um, of the projects that we worked on that I brought today is Checker Toby and the Secret of Our Planet. It's a German feature film aimed at kids. It stems from a TV show. The Checker Toby is a weekly TV show that is on, on at Kika and Bayerischer Rundfunk. And Toby goes out into the world and is explaining stuff so that children understand what's going on. And he's quite popular. The TV show uh, runs in a quite good way, so they decided that it would be a good idea to give him a feature film, bring him on the big uh, screen, so he can reach even more kids and just bring that brand a bit further. So that's what they did. The production company was Megahertz, also based in Munich, and we did all the 3D animation and all the effects for it. So it's a real feature film, so there's a poster and there's a premiere and I'm standing there looking all happy and wearing a suit, so it's really important that you look good, not like today, but that is just to show you that I'm not bullshitting you, it's actually a feature film that you can watch in cinemas. And I'm going to talk a bit about the different sequences that we did, just going through the film sequence by sequence. And the first one that you can see in the movie is Volcano Earth. What happens is that the whole film starts in a way that Toby is doing a shoot on a pirate ship and they are doing some sword fighting and you can see that it's a shoot because you can see the cameras and in the end of that pirate shooting he falls into the ocean and he finds a riddle there and the riddle is giving him like four things that he has to solve 
sending him on a journey around Earth, figuring out stuff. And if you want to hear the spoiler, the, the thing with that movie is, if you don't want to hear it, just, just shut your ears. Um, it, it's all about water. Uh, the, the meaning of the film, what kids are supposed to learn, is, is that water is important. So the first sequence is Volcano Earth. We are starting millions of years back when there wasn't any water at all on Earth. It was uh, just a planet of, of volcanoes. And how did water come onto that volcano Earth? That is the first sequence. And here's a short bit of animation that is explaining this. The voiceover is German because it's a German film. There's no subtitles because it's not aimed at an international market. So if you don't understand German, just ignore what's being said because we're talking about the visuals anyway. Wenn man da oben am Krater steht, fühlt sich das an wie eine Zeitreise. Milliarden von Jahre zurück. In eine Welt, in der unsere Erde von Vulkanen überzogen war. Als es noch kein Leben gab. Nicht mal Flüsse oder Ozeane. Und die Wissenschaftler rätseln immer noch, wie aus dem Feuerball von damals unser blauer Planet geworden ist. Die einen glauben, es waren die Vulkane der Urerde, die Wasser, das schon immer im Erdinneren gespeichert war, als Dampf an die Oberfläche gepustet haben. Andere Forscher vermuten, unser Wasser stammt aus dem All, von großen Himmelskörpern, auf denen es Eis gab und die dann wie Schneewelle auf die Erde gedonnert sind. Und wieder andere Wissenschaftler sagen, beides stimmt. Letzte Nacht habe ich kaum ein Auge zugekriegt. So that's the general look and feel, the style of the animations that we did. And of course, of course when you're starting such a project, first step is always developing a style and a mood and, and just the look of the animation bits of the film. Our starting point was the TV show, obviously, because that is in existence for, I don't know, 10 years or so. It's been on TV for quite some time. So the one thing that is animated in the TV show is the intro. So that was our starting point. We were told to just watch the intro and then just improve on that, take ideas from the intro and derive the style for the animation from that. And this is the intro of the TV show, our starting point. Checker Toby, and what do you make of this? I mean, it, it works as a, as a television intro. It, it's fine, and, and it's working, but it's, it's very, very busy and very fast-paced. And if you do an animation for a feature film that runs for two hours and the animation bits were 20 minutes of the runtime of the whole movie, you can't do that tempo. Like, it, it's too busy. Everyone's minds will explode. And, kids are watching this film, if you sit like four to eight year old kids in a cinema and they watch this for 20 minutes, it, it might, you won't get them to sleep at night. So we took ideas from that. It's handmade. That is one word that we took from this. It's sort of stop motion style, but we didn't want to do one of those ugly looking stop motion lookalike 3D animations because that's always a bit like uh, like if you want to do stop motion, do stop motion, please. I haven't really seen a lot of good examples of 3D animation trying to be stop motion, so we wanted to avoid that, just animating on twos or threes. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to have a good quality, high production value kind of 3D animation and not a stop motion make after thing. So that is something we didn't want to do, but that you're building it yourself. It's made with your hands and not a laser cutter. That, that was sort of the idea. The, our animations should look a 
bit like a, a kid was building it along with his father and they were building the world and that was sort of the idea. And that was the first few renderings that we did. And noticed real quickly that it is not just slapping a texture on a sphere and using a lot of bump because that is not really bringing us a long way. That was the very first renderings we did for planet Earth and we noticed very quickly that it really is it's all in the details. We needed to add a lot of details, and details doesn't mean that we download a paper texture and put it into the bump channel. That was not enough. That is what the upper um, right image is doing. And it's not really working because it's not really looking a lot like paper, and it's not really looking interesting either. One image that is working better is the lower left one, where we started to put like small things on the planet, and it's got a little bit of moss here in the greener areas of Africa, and, and this, the, the lower left image, is one that worked really nicely. And out of the four images, we thought that this one here has a lot of nice stuff and we could improve on that. And we learned that it's not just having a sphere with a texture on, but you actually need to put a lot of deliberately placed detail onto that thing to make it look nice. So detail that we thought would look nice is having like small palm trees and also doing a lot of illustrations. These um, octopus things, the, the squids and, and all other illustrations we had, they were drawn on paper, scanned in, that it was giving us that hand-drawn look because it's actually hand-drawn and it's giving you another 2% on your way to a, a good-looking asset. So we placed a lot of details on, like here, hand-drawn illustrations, moss things, grassy things, um, plasticine, I think it's called in English, like all the mountains look like they've been formed using your fingers and then just modeling it. So that was what we did, just placing a lot of details onto all of our assets, not just planet Earth, but every asset that we built, and that was the final one that was approved, as you can see, hand-placed, deliberate details. The um, oceans have a lot of um, wavy things that add detail and also having clouds um, in space, like we're not really keeping to scale that much because it's a toy world and, you, and toys don't care about proper scale, so the clouds are all the way up into space and they are filling the background quite nicely, so that was our approved planet Earth that we went with. If you look at the cinema scene, um, one of the, uh, the, the baselines of this talk here is to keep things simple. Sometimes you tend, in a 3D program, you tend to make things over complex. And I'm also trying, always trying to avoid that. We are working for clients like Nike, for example, where they always have those really complex effects of shoes building up and there's lots of particles and it is a really complex thing to do. But if you can, keep things simple. Like as you can see with the number of materials, there's not a, a, a thousand of them and there's not even a hundred of them. I don't know how many they are, but they are very, like just use as many materials as you need, but don't create a lot of them because you think that's cool. To, to fill your material manager. Keep a, an orderly structure in your scene. Of course, everything's folder, but as you can see, there's a null object called Earth, and in there it's a VDB volume. That's the clouds um, that are spinning around the planet. They were simulated in Turbulence FD and brought into Octane using a VDB because Turbulence got a converter. It can convert the simulated turbulence cache into a VDB cache, which has the advantage that VDB is just an industry-wide standard, and render engines can render that. And it's very easy to just uh, drag and drop the VDB sequence in. So that is a turbulence simulation converted to a VDB sequence brought into Octane. Octane was our engine for this because we relied heavily on glows and Octane's got very nice built-in glows. We weren't using them in all shots, but sometimes it, it looked good, just the rendering of Octane's. In other shots, we created some more refined glow effects in compositing, So, but that was one of the reasons why we have chosen Octane for the render engine. And it's a very, very flexible and, and nice engine and, and it's giving you good image quality rather quickly. 
so you don't need to work that much and you can go home earlier and that is very nice. So the topic, keep everything simple. Also if you uh, looked at the, uh, the globe it was like crumpled and, and not so a, a perfect sphere but dented and stuff. But of course you build it as a perfect sphere, you switch on a displacer and you've got that crumpling going on if I go back and forth. This is the way we built it and then in the end we put a displacer on so keep it simple. Don't try to place everything on a dented deformed sphere if you can place it on a simple sphere and just deform it afterwards. As you can see here in the attribute manager we used a bitmap displacement that has the continents and um, um, the ocean uh, areas and then we put the noise on top just to give it a bit more variation and the color and the gradient is just masking out the pole areas so we're not getting too much uh, stretching here through the texture. So everything uh, built in simple shapes then displaced, deformed, wrapped into uh, place to give it a more complex appearance. As I said, we were adding a lot of smaller detail to make that thing interesting. Grass and moss was done using the hair system, just um, doing a, a polygon selection and uh, building hair onto that polygon selection. Shorter one for moss, longer one for grass, and with the inbuilt hair shader, you can see that the length of the, the single grass blades and, and moss thingies is controlled by a noise shader. That's another thing. Put noise on everything because it takes away the regularity. So that is always nice. And then there's a lot of uh, frizz and kink and twist and wave and you just stick everything in there because it makes it really like twirly and twisty. And that is also, especially for creating moss and grass effects, just using the standard uh, cinema material for hair is giving you a lot of options just to get irregularity and organic flowing shapes in there. So that was how we put grass and, and moss and that kind of stuff onto our planet. If you take a closer look at Volcano Earth, uh, close-up rendering, again, we were trying to make it look like handmade by uh, a child along with his father because we didn't want to go only child because that would have been too messy maybe. So an orderly chaos is what we wanted. So the surface texture looks like uh, ripped paper, again, plasticine for the mountains a bit of glowing emission shaders for the lava kind of thing. And next, uh, close-up rendering, the volcanoes, again, looking like handmade um, fingerprint textures bring you a long way, so you can actually see fingerprints on the surface leaving uh, traces while building, so that was another way of bringing a lot of detail in, just using very detailed textures. Again, a bit of moss and, and bushy stuff that was killed by the client because even if it is a, a, a movie for children, there was a, a scientific guy who was also looking at the stuff that we're doing and he was saying you didn't have bushes and vegetations on volcano earth three billion years ago. So it looked nice, but that was killed due to scientific reasons. Clouds, again, turbulence FD, you simulate one and put it there, then you simulate the second one, put it somewhere else, and then you take a copy of the first one, rotate it by 90 degrees and put it there. And that's how you fill the planet with clouds without simulating for three million years. A close-up of one of the volcanoes, like that was another thing. It looks like it's a random a pattern that is happening, but actually the science guy was telling us, oh no, you need to have that layer and that layer and this one, and they need to become thinner to the top because it's building up and it's, it's moving the, the layers upwards. And how we did that was, again, when we're looking at the cinema scene, that was the, the scene that got rendered. Of course, we rendered in layers, so we didn't render one image for everything. We rendered the planet the backgrounds and comped it together so we could do a bit more in compositing, like doing color corrections for the background and the planet itself. So of course you render in layers. But that was the scene that we had in the end. Again, all the clouds, VDB volumes rendered in Octane, simulated in turbulence. The background, just a few planes with illustrations, 
it's all in, it vanishes in depth of field anyway, it's blurred out, so it, you don't need to add that much. And it, it really works just keeping it simple, a few planes, the sphere for the planet, and it's really good. That's the planet itself with the surface pattern going on, and if you look a bit closer, it's not actually the planet cut in half and we are not using the actual geometry from the sphere, but if you need to do something like this, like having that area that requires a lot of attention to detail, sometimes it's also a good idea just to use a different object for that because you can uh, care about the UV unwrapping of this one separately from the rest, so we just took that second object, just slapped it in front and as we only had that frontal view, you never see that it's not actually matching the surface and it's not really interacting, but it's just a separate object just slapped on top. And that was done using a sweep NURB. It's not NURB anymore, I'm sorry. That shows that I'm really old. It's a sweep only, a sweep object. And in order to get the UVs right without doing UV unwrapping, because I'm sorry, Max, and UV unwrapping is not really one of your strong points here, so if, you get a, uh, so if you can build an object that has proper UVs already, that is desirable. Because if you uh, have wonky UVs, it's going to be a tough day for you. So in order to get the UVs right, what you can do is using a sweep. And if I deactivate that, you can see my sweep consists not of two splines, the path and the cross section but it consists of three splines, the path, the cross section, and a rail spline, and that is always a very nice way of creating such shapes. UVs are perfect with sweep, so that is a cool thing about sweep. It's giving you very nice aligned UVs, so you don't need to care about them at all. And by using two splines, this is the rail spline, the one that I uh, selected, the vertices, this is the rail spline. So what the sweep is doing, it's taking the cross section, which is just a rectangle, it's moving it along the, the spline that we just saw, the path, and scaling it so it fits the rail spline. And this is how that object is done. And as it's a sweep, UVs are perfect, you just take a a gradient, slap it on, and you're done, and it's a really straightforward thing without any UV unwrapping. A cool thing about this shot is the snowballs hitting Earth and melting. This is something that I show you quickly that wasn't done in cinema. But I show you anyway, this was done uh, using Houdini, and the cool thing with using Houdini simulations along with cinema is that the connection is very, very good. We're not using Houdini Bridge, we're just using alembic imports and exports, but all the uh, pervert is, pervertex data is uh, coming over, and Cinema can use that very nicely. So in this case, what, does, what the Houdini simulation does is it's uh, simulating grains, it's simulating small particles. They are hitting the surface, and they have an attribute that is telling, oh, it's ice, it's frozen. That is why they are gray. And as soon as they're hitting the surface, the ice is melting, and the attribute is changing from this particle is ice into this particle is now water. And that is represented by the color. So blue is attribute water, gray is attribute snow. And this attribute is coming over to cinema. And that is very nice because you can use that as a mask for the shader. So you can change the shader from ice to water using the stuff that Houdini simulated. And it's a very, very fluid interaction. It's fluid, that was a cool joke, uh, sorry. Um, it's a very, very, like, it's working very well in terms of connecting the two programs together, so that's why we do that for more effects heavy simulations, it's working really nicely. And if you, as the, as the water is using gravity for its movement, if you uh, put a map of the continents in, which is displacing the surface, automatically the water is forming the oceans. So that was that, simulating snowballs hitting Earth, bringing it over to cinema and rendering it, again, using Octane. And when you look at the background, there's not really that much to see. Again, it's illustrations that you can't really see because they are so out of focus and blurry, but they are there and you can feel it. You don't really see it, but you can feel that there's something there and it's not just black. And then we've got those light thingies going on and if you look at the animation, at the movie they are 
like changing their color and also their intensity a bit, then that's another no-brainer. That's a really quick thing to do. If you go in, that's a setup using MoGraph. As you can see, it's a cloner cloning spheres onto that spline. And then there's a random effector, and the random effector is not doing what it's usually doing. By default, it's not moving the position of the spheres. That's all turned off. As you can see, position, scale, rotation is switched off. What the random effector is doing here, it's got the color mode on. So it's affecting the color of the clones. That is brought into the shader using a MoGraph color shader if you are using one of the uh, inbuilt render engines. And also Octane and Redshift that we are also using, they can read that data. So if you, whenever you're having like slight animations in shaders, in intensities, in colors, it's always a good idea to just look at MoGraph's color modes because that's very, very powerful. And a very quick setup, like this setup is done in 20 minutes, uh, in 20 seconds, I'm sorry. And you've got a thing that you can just put in your background and it's animated slightly, it's not static, and that is always a good thing. All right, as you can see, another thing is we've only got one spline for, the, for that chain-like thing here, but it's got an outline of two smaller strings going around, and this can be achieved by using not one circle as the cross-section in the sweep, but a very powerful trick is to use two circles and combine them together, and this way you can do like um, dual strings forming one rope. If you're using end rotation, it will also twist while it's going around, so using this as the cross-section and not a single circle. This is a minor thing, but I wanted to show you anyway because I personally was pretty happy when I merged the, uh, the circles together and ended up with only one sweep instead of two. A small thing that speeds up stuff. One setup that we needed to do is, as Toby is traveling the world in his film, he's going from, he's really literally going all over the globe. He's uh, going to Arctica and, and Australia and um, Vanuatu, which is a small island in the Pacific Ocean. So we needed to have a map that was showing where Toby is so you can keep track where he's going. And this is how we did that. Check out Toby. Und das Geheimnis unseres Planeten. Na dann, los geht's. 30 Stunden mit dem Flugzeug. Von Deutschland über Indien und Australien bis in ein kleines Land mitten im Pazifik. Nach Vanuatu. So it's a string that is weaving itself onto our planet, showing the travel path of Toby. And the way we did that, again, you start simple because that's the thing I want to uh, show you today, that you start simple and then make it more complex in the process. So you're not doing a path that is going round on a sphere, but you start with a simple straight line. And then you deform it in order to get that weaving effect going. And the general principle is that, just showing you that straight line, you can use effectors MoGraph effectors and switch them to actually affect the vertices of the spline and they, so they can't only be used for MoGraph clones but also as deformers. So you've got that straight line, you subdivide it a bit so you've got a few points to work with and what you do is you get for example a MoGraph random effector, put it in and nothing happens because by default in the deformers tab, the deformation is set to off, so it's not acting on the vertices of the spline, it's only there to act on clones, but we don't have clones, so what we can do is we switch that to points, and now suddenly that random effector is affecting the points of an object, and that is a very, very nice way of working because you can use the power of all MoGraph effectors now to affect the vertices of splines of polygon objects and this is very cool because what you can do is in our setup for the weaving string, we put in a formula effector. You know, you always have to bring a bit of math into these presentations, but it's, 
it's a very, very simple formula that is going on. It's got a sine wave. As you can see in the formula, we've got a sine wave, and a sine wave is just a wave. It's going up and down in a wavy form, and we are using that sine wave to deform the straight lines into a wavy shape. And a sine wave is going from minus 1 to plus 1. That's the range of a sine. So if we multiply that by 2, for example, we make it a big bigger, big bigger, and then we clamp it. And what this is doing, it's removing the top bits of the, of the wave function. So we are basically cutting off the top bits, making it a bit more irregular and not so mathematically correct wavy, but we are cutting just a few bits off. And this helps to make it a bit more organic and going away from that mathematically perfect function. Another thing that helps is not using too many points on the spline because then you get errors in calculation and it's a bit off here and there because there's not enough points in there and that's also making it a bit more wiggly and more natural. So that's the first effect that we used, a sine wave to make it wavy. Then there's another sine wave to make it even wavier, but that is restricted by a spherical falloff, so you only get it in that area that is sitting inside that yellow sphere. It's using a falloff here in newer version because that was done in Cinema 19, in Cinema 20 that will be a field because they revamped the falloff and turned it into fields and it's much more powerful now. So one sine wave to make it a bit bigger, then another sine wave to make it also more wavy, but this time in uh, the Y and Z direction. If I go back, that first sine wave, this one, if you look at the position here, it's deforming it in X direction. The other one is deforming it mostly in Y direction, also a bit in Z. So that is to have different controls for the different dimensions. You can have separate controls for the stretching and for the, uh, in X direction, so in horizontal in this way, and then another object which controls the vertical stretching. So this is giving you quite a lot of control to just separate the dimensions and have separate controls for X and Y direction. So now you've got that, just combining different sine waves together. And once you've got that, you add a bit of a, a shader effector that is basically just um, displacing it a little bit. As you can see, there's a noise in there. So if I go back and forth, that's without, that's with the shader effector. So what that does, it's making, a bit, it's making it a bit crumply. That's all that this is doing. And once that is done, what you do is you then wrap it around your, uh, your sphere. The wrap deformer is taking a flat thing and it's making it wrap around the sphere. So this way you can save all the crazy going around in 3D space and you just build a straight line and then create your 3D shape afterwards. So this is what comes out. It's, um, I recorded it in slow motion. You can see a bit better. So what's happening is the effectors are running around the spline. They are deforming it, making it bigger and then sink back in again. That is what the spherical falloff is doing. And then the end growth option of the sweep is used to generate the geometry. So the thing is weaving and it's tracing the path that Toby is flying. And in order to make everything a bit more straightforward for the animator, we uh, did a very, very simple user data expresso setup where we combined all the animatable parameters into that little interface. That is also something that we like to do quite a lot of times, just making it easy for the animators to find stuff that they can animate so they don't have to dig into technical setups. Another technical setup, ocean waves. If we look at the planet again, you can Na see dann. at Los the geht's. 30 Stunden uh, coastal mit dem lines, there's um, Von Deutschland über Indien waves coming in and that is und adding Australien. a nice bit of animation so the whole Land. scene is not so static, the asset is not so static and we've got just waves uh, crashing into the coastline and we did that like this. Also again, very, very simple. The, the movement of the wave is done using a post-morph tag. So we uh, have drawn a spline in the starting position and then we did a post-morph in the end position. We were just 
blending between the two, so that's our wave moving again, doing everything flat, wrapping it onto our planet once we've got the, opt, uh, the, the setup finished. The geometry is uh, generated using a sweep again. There's a rectangle that is sweeping around the spline and when you unfold the details tab you can set a spline for the scaling. We just added a few points, they are all at scale zero, so you can't see anything. But if you would move the points up, the, the shape would scale up, um, revealing the wave shape. And this wasn't done manually, this wasn't animated manually, we did a small espresso here. This looks like more than it actually is. What it is doing, if you just focus on one of the, the noise range mapper, multiply things here, we are getting a noise that's just like noising over time, giving you random values. We are range mapping that with the spline you can see on the right, so what it does is we are just clipping a lot from the noise. So we have a lot of non-movement in the beginning, then the noise is kicking in, and then we have a lot of holding the last frame in the end, multiplying it with an animation value, and feeding that into every one of the scale spline um, points that we have just seen. What this is doing is, it's randomizing the scale, so for every point that was added here, we had uh, a noise kicking in and that was animating, and when you look at it in animation, I don't know, that's another displacer that I added, just to crumple it a bit in X direction, in Y direction, to have control for both directions. And this is the movie here, so this is what the noise is doing, it's moving the points of the scaling up and down, and therefore revealing that wave-like shape in our geometry. Then we put a paper texture on top, a bit of alpha channel to get rid of the harsh edges, to have more of a ripping paper pattern in the alpha channel. And that's how this was created, waves rolling into the coastal areas on the planet. And that range mapper, which was making sure that in the beginning and in the end there was no movement in the scale of the sweep, that is making sure that they are starting at scale zero and they are ending at scale zero. So you can just, if one wave is hitting the shoreline, it's at zero, so you don't see it anymore, and it's just popping back to its beginning. So it's a looping animation and you can keep that forever and just put it on your planet and have another layer of detail and this is what I'm showing you here, just putting on layers after layers and this is what it's looking rendered. Na dann, los geht's. 30 Stunden mit dem Flugzeug. Von Deutschland über Indien und Australien bis in ein kleines Land mitten im Pazifik. Nach Vanuatu. Waves on the planet. If you are working in advertisement, you know what's coming now. The logo of Checker Toby was, if you uh, remember from the, the intro of the TV show, it's a 2D logo in the TV show. So of course for cinema, you need to make it 3D, you make, need to make it big and epic and whatnot. And logo development, that is something, I'm not going to talk to this, I'm just clicking through the slides. This is a few of the steps we did there have to be more, but just take a look. That's the final one in the title sequence of Checker Toby. Of the film. Und das Geheimnis unseres Planeten. And that's the development that we did. Starting like this and then the feedback kicked in. Toby. And it was worth it, don't you think? 
sequence two, and I really need to hurry up, that's a spacewalk. Another uh, guy who's really big on clean water is a guy named Tardigrade. That's a microscopic animal. It can be dead for like two years or 10 years. You, you can't measure any activity, it's just dead. And if you put a drop of water on, it's just shaking itself and continuing with his life. They are really, really tough motherfuckers, if I may say so. <laughs> and they have been put into space. They actually took like 100, uh, 100,000 of them into a box, uh, brought them up into space and put them on the outside of the International Space Station and left them there for, I think, a month or so. And when they brought the guys back in, I don't know the, the exact number, but I think seven or eight percent of them were still alive, so they are tough. And they were in the film. Come on, come on. Ein Bärtierchen im Weltraum. Das gab's wirklich. Die Winzlinge waren Teil einer Forschungsmission. Dabei haben die Astronauten entdeckt, dass die achtbeinigen Bären absolute Superhelden sind. Die überleben sogar im All, ohne Raumanzug. Das kann kein Mensch, kein anderes Tier. Seitdem gelten die Bärtierchen als die größten Überlebenskünstler der Welt. Aber was hat das mit dem Herz der Erde zu tun? Überleben Bärtierchen vielleicht auch in Vulkanen? Und was? So. Going through that a bit quicker. Development of the rocket. This is uh, how we start a lot of our creative development. We go on Google image search, we go on Behance, and we go on Pinterest and just rip a lot of images off the internet, put it onto a slide like this, and put small annotations next to it what I want to show with these images. Like that's a reference for the kind of bumpy thingies that they have on their rockets, that's reference or, or images that I thought would look nice for landing gear and for capsule design and stuff. And it's giving you a good overview of general style and then you start your model. And this was the first model of the rocket that I built. I thought it would be a good idea to, as we're having squids on the planet, make, uh, make a rocket that is sort of a small squid-like character with a big head and a big eye and a few tentacles, but feedback was, no, that is not a good idea. Please get rid of that head thing. So I got rid of the head thing, and this was, like that's images I sent out to the client to get feedback and to get approval. So that was the, the basic shape of the rocket that was approved, adding detail, emergency rockets on top, a lot of technical details just slapped on and all the details have been carefully downloaded again from the internet. Because if you go on the internet, there's a shitload of ready-made technical greeble kind of bits and you don't have to model that yourself. Go on the internet, download things. That's not a cheating trick or tip I was, I'm giving you. It's not cheating using these, it's professional production workflow. Don't model things that are available. And if you put them on, there's a lot of technical detail and the texturing of the rocket and all of our assets that was supposed to look like, like again, very natural, like someone has painted it at home, not in a professional way, but in a sort of like, okay, I'm just paint this because it's my hobby. And you can see the brush strokes and it's not very perfect. And, uh, small little bit of uh, program that I want to show you is worth painting. I've shown this video in a lot of presentations uh, that I've done before, but I really, really like that uh, program. It's free, you can just download it. It's a painting program, a 2D painting program, and it's got that one option, it's called Fluidity. And if you up Fluidity, what it does is, is making a 2D fluid simulation. So the brush strokes act like they are actually wet paint and the color is interacting with each other. It's smearing and it's just simulating a fluid. And this is a very, very nice little bit uh, piece of program to do these kind of things like brush strokes that have a very, very natural and, and sort of raw appearance. Worth Painter can be downloaded from the internet. The interface is completely bonkers. I don't know, interface design that stopped in 1982, but it's a good, it, the technology is very good. 
and that's the approved rocket. And if we look at the production scenes again, clean, orderly, don't have a huge mess in your scene and name your objects. That's professional production, you're naming your objects, that is very important. And if you're not naming your objects, you can go to the front office and get your paperwork because it's really, really bad to have messy scenes when no one is knowing what everyone is doing and you're spending so many hours a day just looking for stuff. That is stupid. That's the poly count. It's polygons. We use polygons to model our stuff. That's a surprising reveal here. For the background, uh, Toby is um, having that notebook that is uh, accompanying him throughout the film. So the background mountains were modeled as if they were books lying there to get a bit of concept going and not just randomly slapping in stuff. And again, lots of details, like when the rocket is starting, the small birds are waking up. And this is also just a nice touch, and no one is seeing this, but it's there, and it's a lot of fun doing these things. And if only one child is noticing that uh, birds are waking up when the rocket is starting, I did my job. For the tardigrade, I've got another show like with the logo, there's a lot of iterations. I've put them together here, there are lots of iterations and iterations. This is a actual photo uh, of a microscopic image of the thing and we tried to match that a bit. And then it's the tardigrade and the tardigrade and now my time is up and the only thing I want to show you is that we have used the input character object to read the guy so we didn't create a a uh, rig of our own, but it's based on the character object's insect rig, and the face, facial animations were done using just deformers. We didn't even use post morphs because it, it didn't have a lot of facial animation. It was just sucking along, and that was done using bends and uh, squash and stretches and that kind of stuff. And so again, very, very simple. I don't have any fancy, complex, mind-blowing stuff to show you, but what I want to show you is that you can use the most simplest of tools to create a feature film that has 450,000 visitors in, in Germany only, and that's a really cool thing. And as now, my time is really up. The only thing, three slides left, because yes, I'm standing up here, but there's so many people involved. And this is a list of people that were working on the project. I wanted to show you another project, Glenn Dimplex. Time ran out, so this one we didn't see, but that's the people working on it. If you want to take a picture, please don't book them because you're not stealing freelancers from me. If you do, I'll find you. And, <laughs> and this is the point where I say thank you very much for your interest. I hope you found something interesting in my talk, and if you have any questions, you probably need to find me afterwards because the next speaker is in line, and I've only got 30 seconds to say thank you. Have a very good FMX, and maybe see you after. Thank you. Thank you.